Hey guys, I'm your host Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Bankai, Baffling Japanese Internet Mysteries Volume 3 is now out. If you enjoy the particular mysteries that only the internet can offer, then do head over and check it out right now. We also have a brand new design up in the Kowabana merchandise store. You can check that out at kowabana.store. We have shirts, mugs, stickers, masks, and much more, so do check it out and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're looking at some stories that showcase the baffling nature of the other side. Our first story features a group of friends who decide to prank a girl they know as a self-styled psychic, with a fake kotoribako, that infamous box that is particularly dangerous to women and children. However, things don't quite go to plan, and it's just the start of an even more horrifying discovery. Find out why in The Fake Kotoribako. I've been feeling kind of nostalgic about the Kotoribako lately, so let me tell you a little story. Right around the time the Kotoribako story was really popular, One of my friends said he wanted to play a joke on one of our friends, a woman who, by her own words, possessed psychic powers. To cut things short, we made a box that looked just like a kotoribako, and then we planned to use that to scare her. Yeah, it wasn't exactly a joke in good taste. Now, normally somebody might try to put a stop to something like this. But this self-proclaimed psychic had put us through a lot of nonsense in the past. In the end, someone other than the friend who suggested it went ahead and made the fake box. This guy was rather unassuming and didn't especially stand out in any way, but he was good with his hands and often made jewellery and such by himself. So this friend, he bought, not a box exactly, but like, one of those containers they use during tea ceremonies from a second-hand store, and he managed to turn it into something just like a kotoribako. Then it was up to the guy who suggested the whole thing to claim that he found it hidden in his storehouse. I think we spent about a week preparing the whole plan. So, when we were out drinking with this self-proclaimed psychic friend one night, he suddenly brought the topic up. So... When I went back to my parents' home, she was immediately intrigued. Oh yeah, I heard a scary story on the internet just like that, said another friend, adding a little more information to draw the psychic in. That friend's family home used to be a samurai residence in the past, so the story was rather convincing. And the guy who made the box joined in with the psychic, acting like, He'd never heard of it before. Another time, we all gathered at a family restaurant to discuss another friend's upcoming wedding. Oh yeah, so about that thing I told you about last time, that weird box in the storehouse. I brought it here today, my friend said, and then produced the fake kotoribako. What the hell? That's dangerous! The psychic suddenly screamed. She didn't say that she looked at the story on the internet, but she started to explain the story of the kotoribako to us like she had first-hand experience with it. That story is fake, I said, ignoring her. Why don't you try opening it? It was my job to get her to open it, and I knew what was inside. Again, it's a little in bad taste, but the inside of the box was just like the story as well but fake, of course. We got some prank toy fingers from the toy store and painted them like they were covered in blood. And I mean, if you think about it rationally, if they were the real thing, then they would be dried up, right? At any rate, the self-proclaimed psychic actually trembled and watched over me anxiously as I went to open the fake box. Stop! Some of my friends screamed. Do it! screamed others. Everyone was getting worked up and I placed my hand on the lid of the fake box. But I couldn't open it. It was like it was stuck. 
I turned to look at the guy who made it before I could stop myself, but he looked just as confused. As I was still trying to force it open, suddenly somebody approached us. You mustn't open that, they said out of nowhere. I turned around and a man who looked half Japanese stood there. He grabbed my hand and removed it from the box, then glared at us. You don't need this, do you? I'll take it off your hands, he said, and then left the restaurant. The rest of us just sat there, dumbfounded. What the hell was that? Did somebody else organise it? I wondered. But then another person who seemed to be that man's friend came over to us. How did I know he was his friend? Because he yelled, Hey, wait! as that man left the store. Ah, I'm sorry about that. He's a little weird, right? But please forgive him, the man said. He then paid and left the restaurant as well. The self-proclaimed psychic was crying actual tears of relief after that man left the store with the fake box. We were kind of let down, but our objective all along had just been to scare her, so we figured that that would have to be good enough, and we all went our separate ways for the night. The real surprise came a few days later. It turned out that strange half-Japanese man was my brother's classmate at university. When I left work one day, he was waiting for me with my brother. My brother already knew about all the nonsense the self-proclaimed psychic had done over the years, and he knew of the fake Kotoribako as well. But how was all this connected? Honestly, it was kind of creepy. My brother introduced the guy as an acquaintance, and at first I thought he deliberately came over to stop us as part of the plan, but as it turned out, he was simply there by coincidence. I mean, they lived in the area, so it wasn't like it was entirely out of the question. The moment he saw me, the man said, You shouldn't make anything like that ever again. I thought he was talking about our prank at first, and thanks to his intervention, it did end on a rather sour note. And so, feeling embarrassed that someone younger than me was telling me off, I nodded. Yeah, I won't do it again. The man sighed. You like the occult, don't you? If so, then you must realise that truly dangerous things do exist, right? A chill ran down my spine. The person who made that box, even if they didn't intend to make the real thing, that doesn't mean what they made wasn't dangerous. Like, even if the contents weren't real, the ill intentions directed towards the person opening it sure were close enough, you know? He didn't elaborate any further, but he didn't need to. I once heard that the friend who made the box had been rejected by the psychic girl in high school, and because of that, his girlfriend at the time dumped him too. Both of them were a little younger than me, so I never heard the full details, but he sure seemed excited to make that box to fool her, and he put his all into it. It seemed my brother had heard a little more about matters from this guy, and so, a short while later, I went out with him for drinks to ask him some stuff. I was interested in this strange half-Japanese guy, you see? In short, this is what my brother told me. This man really was half Japanese. His mother was apparently Russian. He also possessed a rather strong psychic sense, but he rarely spoke of it. However, when something was about to get truly dangerous, he always moved into action. And, it seemed, the friend who made the box came from what you might call a cursed lineage, who dealt especially with curses and hexes. I was like, Seriously? That was twice now that he had helped me after getting involved. On that note, the guy who created the box ended up dying very suddenly, roughly two years later. I didn't have much contact with him after the debacle with the fake Kotoribako, but one day I heard from a friend that he had died. He was still young and rather healthy, 
But one night, he went home and then the next morning, he just didn't wake up. I saw the half-Japanese guy not long after that. He died, didn't he? I think he gave away handmade presents, so please collect them for me, he said out of the blue. I didn't really know what he was talking about, but I contacted a friend and we went and collected all the stuff he'd ever made. The man went through everything and only pulled out the items that seemed dangerous. One item in particular, a ring, looked dangerous even to me. It wasn't the physical shape of it or anything, but still. Ah, I think a lot of this is my fault, the man said. I think he realised that what he was making was the real thing after our interaction with the box. That's probably why he died so young as well. Luckily, I kept my distance from him after that night with the box, so I didn't know much of what was going on. But apparently, that friend started making even more jewellery after that night, and really put his all into it. The guy who received that dangerous ring was a friend of ours who, it seemed, had married the boxmaker's crush. The whole thing was no laughing matter, honestly. Even if you don't know it yourself, the blood you inherit from your ancestors is nothing to be made fun of the half-Japanese man said. For some reason, that line in particular really stuck in my mind. I heard that the half-Japanese guy is somewhere overseas now. I feel like I might hear from him again sometime in the future, but I'm not sure how I feel about that because if he does contact me, it undoubtedly won't be for anything good. Oh yeah, so the second time he helped me, was actually rather recently, maybe roughly two years ago now. The younger sister of one of my colleagues died in a traffic accident, and after that, her spirit started to appear by his bedside. He visited various temples and shrines, but nothing worked, and day by day, he was falling more and more ill. And so, that half-Japanese man suddenly showed up one day, and stayed with him for a bit. After that, all the strange phenomena stopped. Not everyone can see ghosts. It's an ability you just happen to be born with. At least, that's what the internet would have you believe. And the woman in this next story finds out that perhaps she is one of those people. Find out why in When I Saw It. This took place when I was working part-time at a cake shop. I entered the store as a salesperson, and there were around seven pastry chefs there every day making cakes. I hadn't yet placed all the names to the faces, and I thought I'd use my lunch breaks to get to know everyone, but unfortunately, it wasn't to be. I only got to know the people who worked near the front door. I figured I'd get to see them soon enough, but there was one pastry chef in particular that I wanted to get to know, and we never had our breaks at the same time. I started to question when on earth this person was taking breaks. When we were done closing up store for the day, everyone left at the same time. Is everyone out? I'm gonna lock the changing room now, okay? I called out, and then confirmed everyone was there. I was about to leave, but then I realised that I hadn't accounted for the chef who always worked near the front door. Hang on, we're still missing one person, aren't we? I said, and everyone looked at me blankly. That woman who always has her hat pulled down really far. You know, the one who makes cakes by the table near the front, I explained. Doesn't sound like anyone who works here, the others replied but I was sure she was working with us until just before shop close. Huh, I thought, but I didn't want to drag things out any further, and so we all went home. I had been looking forward to getting to know the chef who had been making cakes all day without break, but after that, I never saw her at that table near the door again. She was gone, just like that, like 
everyone saying she had never been there in the first place. And that was the first time I realised that what I had seen might actually have been a ghost. Several months passed and my last day of working at that cake store arrived. The store manager worked beside me as we sold cakes. I turned around to look in the baked goods section as the store started to get crowded and I saw the back of the manager's black uniform. I thought the manager must have walked over there so I continued serving customers. But then I realised the manager was still right beside me. It seemed there were two of them in the store. Surprised, I looked at one of the pastry chefs through the glass and gestured with my eyes. But the leader just smiled at us in the sales area. It seemed I was the only person who saw this second manager. Ever since then, I sometimes see people that only I can see. Sometimes I also see people who very much look like someone who is dead. I haven't again ever seen two of the same person like the manager though. Usually, I don't even realise it until later, because they look just like a normal person to me. I think they're probably ghosts, but they're different to people because they don't talk. If you try to talk to them, they disappear. They also disappear when I tell others about their existence as well. I think, contrary to expectations, ghosts are all over the place, but it's just that most people can't see them. Ghosts don't just linger in a particular place in Japan. They can also attach themselves to people and objects. For the woman in this next story, her childhood was especially painful because of, well, her father buying cheap lumber to build their family home. Find out the horrifying secret behind it in The Family Home I Didn't Want to Go Back To. For the first time since graduating high school and moving out of home, everyone returned to our family home for the holidays. Our house was built while I was in the lower grades of elementary school, and ever since then, I started suffering from sleep paralysis night after night. I also passed strangers I didn't know in the hallway, and sometimes I even opened the sliding doors to find a room I'd never seen before. Strange. Unexplainable things always seem to occur. And it wasn't just me. It happened to other people in my family as well. And it was a hot topic almost daily. Now, despite the fact that these things happen so often, they still weren't something we could get used to. Every day as night fell, I grew anxious and my body would tense up as though something terrifying was sneaking up on me. There were plenty of rooms in our house, but... I never slept alone. I always went to the toilet and bathroom with my mother as well. My father told me not to tell anyone about the happenings at our house. He seemed to know the cause of what was going on and apparently our house was built from old lumber that a carpenter sold my father for cheap from an old inn that was destroyed. After a fire broke out at that inn and the number of guests dropped, it was apparently closed. Nothing is going to happen. Your mind is telling you it's scary and that's why you feel afraid. That's all. No matter how many times we complained, my father ignored it and pretended to live in blissful ignorance. What else do you want me to do? This is the only house we've got, he said. And even my mother gave up. I wanted to grow up as quickly as possible. That way, I'd be able to leave the house as soon as possible as well. I could tell that sleep paralysis was going to happen before it started. My feet started to feel heavy, and then the area around my stomach started to feel numb. After that, my entire body went rigid. In order to break the paralysis, I just had to speak, but that was easier said than done. If you're ever in that state, then you can get rid of it by shaking your body. And so, for the first time in a long time, our family sat around the dinner table. My parents, my husband and I, 
and our five-year-old son and three-year-old daughter. My son sat there staring at the corner of the living room, not touching his food. I got chills. Can you see something over there? They're eating something. Just don't look and eat your own food, okay? I suddenly remembered that the house was built from old lumber that came from an inn. Perhaps my son was seeing something different to the rest of us. As I laid out our bedding, my daughter sang a song I'd never heard before, and next thing I knew, she was asleep. Thankfully, those were the only things that happened during our visit home. And when morning arrived, I was flooded with relief, a feeling I was familiar with from the past. A short while later, my son came up to me. I want to go back to Grandma and Grandpa's house again, he said. I've never taken my kids back there since that trip. But I want to play with H. Kun and N. Chan. I'd never heard those names before in my life, but then I suddenly remembered an old memory of two children playing in a dark room in the back of our house when I was a child. I heard they already moved away. I know you want to play with them again, I told him. I absolutely did not want to tell my children a scary story or something to make them fear the world. I think they're better off just not knowing. In this next story, we're heading to a temple in the countryside for another potentially haunted object. Can even temples be haunted? As it turns out, well, maybe. Find out why in Ringing. So, I'm a monk who has written here before, and I'm back to kill a little time again. I was born and raised in a temple, and most of the families nearby are our parishioners. I may be young, but I am a fully grown man, and the chief priest of our temple. Ever since my first supernatural experience, it's become a hobby of mine to collect similar scary stories, especially those that revolve around temples. As it was with my previous experience, and that of other monks who are older than me, it seems that most scary stories involving temples are related to sounds, and this particular story is one I heard from the colleague of a colleague, a monk called H-san. H-senpai was just shy of 40, and the second son of a rather large temple in the Kanto area. He worked for many years as office staff at a university connected to our sect, but then one day he got a call from a temple without a chief priest. Won't you come and be our chief priest? They asked him. And so, that was how he came to live all the way out in the countryside, just like me. It was about an hour's drive from where I lived, a somewhat well-developed area with a brand new temple building as well. If a brand new young priest is going to come, then we need a magnificent brand new building as well, the parishioners said, and they pooled all their money together to build it. This moved H. Senpai so much that he promised to do his best to fulfill his duties as the new chief priest. And it was he who proposed a study meeting for new monks in the area so we could exchange ideas and information as well. As he was explaining something about the inner sanctum during one of these meetings, I noticed something rather odd. There is a position called an ina, someone who is in charge of the large bells and gongs used during ceremonies. And so, next to the ina's chair, I saw a rather large, coiled up rosary had been enshrined there. An Ina watches movement in the inner and outer sanctums during ceremonies, and he's in the position of both conductor and performer, so to speak, and keeps the ceremony moving forward with the appropriate timing. He's kind of like the lead guitarist, or the concert master, I guess. So then, that would mean the officiating priest would be the lead vocalist then? 
Uh, I'm getting way off track here. Naturally, the inner seat is located close to the centre of the main hall, and from there, it can see pretty much any point in the building. There was a massive rosary there, one of those so-called million prayer rosaries. These particular rosaries originate from a famous temple in Kyoto. The temple's chief priest quelled a plague that spread in Kyoto at the end of the Kamakura period by reciting the Namu Amida Butsu prayer a million times. And so, people got the idea that if everyone prayed, rather than simply one person, then Buddha could be lauded even more. And so, a large number of people gather in a circle and spin these beads, which are about the size of a baby's head. As they pray more and more, the speed gradually gets faster, and in the end, it kind of feels like they're being pulled alongside the beads. It's unknown when the prayer will end, and as it repeats over and over, you build a sense of camaraderie with those near you. Then, when you finally let go, everyone there has this indescribable sense of unity. If you ever get the chance, you should try it sometime. H-senpai, is that… Now, it's not like this type of rosary is so expensive that it would make your eyes pop. And although it might be difficult to find a place to keep it, you can find them in pretty much any temple as well. It's the type of thing that you find yourself just staring at. That's the impact it has. How can I put it? It certainly makes you feel the changing of the times. It really was perfectly coiled like a snake, around and around, with the head bead, the largest, sitting right at the top. And from that, a string poked out, making it look like a snake sticking its tongue out. This was a gift from an acquaintance, he said. Normally, I only use this one. He pointed to a much smaller rosary that was just lying on the floor. It was a common rosary made of plain boxwood. But what was it about this one? It was kind of brownish, maybe reddish purple, and kind of gleamed a little. At a glance, it was hard to tell if it was made of wood or not. I touched it, and yeah, it probably was wood. It was cool and kind of heavy. Maybe it was coated in something. It's rather heavy, and that makes using it quite tiring. But having said that, I felt bad about hiding it away as well. When I asked, he said it was a present from an overseas monk he got to know when they worked together at the university. H. Senpai was tasked with looking after the monk when he arrived in the country, and one of the things they spoke about was H. Senpai becoming a chief priest. He apparently remembered that conversation. I received this giant wooden box, so I thought maybe a jar was inside, but it was packed full of beads. So he had to thread every single one of those beads by himself? The thought alone made me tired. Several people stared at it, including myself, like, huh. That's quite curious, isn't it? At that, H. Senpai seemed to blush, or maybe smile wryly. Curious, isn't it? He muttered with a strange look on his face. It sure was a sight. After the meeting was over, I thought he might need help cleaning up, so I offered my services and once again asked him about the rosary. The beads cry, you know. At first, that was what I thought he said, but after talking a little more, I realised that wasn't quite what he said. They make a ringing sound. I still didn't understand though. It was a bunch of wooden beads with string through them. If they were going to make a sound, then it would sound like a clacking or something, right? But H. Senpai shook his head. It sounds similar to a bird's cry. At first, I thought maybe it was a puppy or a kitten. A 
Apparently, stray dogs and cats were common on the temple grounds, so that was why he thought that at first. I always hear it at night, but it's not really the season for dogs and cats, nor is it the time birds chirp either. He couldn't hear the noises in his living quarters, but when he walked around the temple at night checking the lights and fires, he could definitely hear it. It was a sharp sound, nothing like a whistle or a hiss, that he could hear intermittently coming from the corner of the building. And considering that it was a brand new building, it was unlikely to be the wind coming through old gaps. Thinking it might be electrical in nature, he turned off the breaker, but the sound didn't stop. Was it coming from beneath the floorboards? No, it was definitely coming from inside the building, and more precisely, from beside the inner's chair. I know where the sound is coming from, but I don't know the source. If I lift the rosary, the sound stops, but when I put it back, it starts again before long. It's just regular old wood, right? It's just regular old wood. He said that it wasn't causing any harm, so he planned to just leave it be. But as he sighed and puffed on a cigarette, he looked awfully tired. I didn't want to keep prying, but at the same time, I didn't think I'd be brave enough to find out for myself either. Yes, I was curious, but I didn't want to be rude to my elder, who was being very serious about the matter. So I left with a rather bad taste in my mouth. I walked through the pitch black temple grounds, turned back to the temple and put my hands together in prayer, and then got in my car. In the distance, I heard what sounded like a baby's cries. The sound got more and more distant, sounding almost like a Japanese tit. For this next story, we're heading over to a shrine to hopefully break a long unlucky spell the narrator has been having. But will it all go according to plan? Find out in First Shrine Visit. This was a slightly strange experience I once had, so I'm going to write it down here. It's about a shrine, so I think this is just the right place for it. There's no real punchline at the end, and it might not be interesting, but I kind of want to tell someone about it. So, if you'd like to hear it, then please listen. Ever since I was a child, I've experienced strange and unexplainable things, but about one year ago, a string of unfortunate occurrences besieged my family. My grandparents were… rather elderly, so I guess that was to be expected, sure. But then, my distant uncle passed away, although he was neither sick nor did he have an accident. All of this happened within six months, so naturally, I was a little fearful and worried. I was also stressed from work. So sometimes while I was at the office, I found myself thinking, what would happen if I jumped from the roof? Looking back on it now, I was incredibly depressed. Just as things were starting to get back on track, I suddenly had an idea. That's it. Let's visit a shrine and cleanse myself of this bad luck. I looked around on the internet and although it didn't house a local Kamisama, I found a shrine that called itself a wolf shrine. I was overjoyed there was one nearby and decided I would visit it immediately that weekend. I read some books and researched on the internet what not to do so as not to offend the gods. And then I was on my way to the shrine. But I overslept that morning and ended up missing my train. The shrine was rather deep in the mountains, so the buses from the station to get there ran only once every hour. I waited restlessly at the empty station for the bus, and as I was feeling rather down, an old lady suddenly approached me. Excuse me, do you have the time? 
Ah, uh, it's ten past eight, I answered, looking at the time on my phone screen. The old lady's face then twisted with disappointment. Oh no, that means the bus has already gone then. Ah. <sighs> Suddenly it hit me. Was this old woman on her way to the shrine too? Are you also on your way to visit Nani Nani Shrine? I asked. The old woman's face perked up. Oh, you too? She replied. And so, as we waited for the bus to come, I had a meeting with an old lady I had just met in front of the station. We bantered back and forth over who would buy the other person a can of coffee and enjoyed some conversation. The anxiety and sadness I felt beforehand seemed to disappear like it had never even existed. And then, an hour later, the swaying bus finally arrived and took us to a small shrine tucked away deep in the mountains. Despite this, there were still numerous villages in the area, as well as shrines dedicated to the local Kamisama, and it seemed that we weren't the only people on our way to visit the shrine that morning. The procedures one had to go through to pray at the shrine were a little different to others, so I watched and learnt from the old woman, and prayed with all my heart. As we waited for the bus to go back, the old woman bought me a cup of sweet sake in return for the coffee I bought her earlier. And so, my first shrine visit ended with warm, fuzzy and enjoyable feelings. I didn't have a kamidana altar at home. So after returning, I wondered where I should put the talisman I received. After thinking it over, I prepared a special spot on the bookcase in my bedroom for it. I rushed around the house, looking for white paper and such. And then, when I got back, I suddenly smelt something as I opened the door to my bedroom. It wasn't the usual smell of my room, but rather something more animalistic in nature. What the hell? I thought, but then I left the room right away to get ready for something else. The more I thought about it, the more it smelt like a dog. I used to have a pet dog in the past, so I knew what it smelt like. The next time I returned to my room, the smell was gone, and I couldn't smell anything else strange either. At present, I am still worried about my job due to the recession, but I no longer feel quite as depressed, and the strange occurrences don't happen quite so often either. Something unfortunate did befall another distant relative recently, but still, I'm feeling okay, and I dare say, rather happy even. I wonder if, perhaps, some of the local Kamisama came to see me, a new worshipper, after my shrine visit. That thought does make me happy, so that's what I've decided to believe. Sorry this was a little long, but thank you for listening. For our final story this week, a young boy decides that he'll try to create a particular cursed magic known as Kodoku. We've had several stories on this show before that have featured Kodoku, which is a type of spell in which various poisonous animals are placed in a box until only one, the strongest remains. That sole survivor is then used to place a terrible curse on someone. And well, find out what happens in… I tried making Kodoku. This happened when I was around 10 years old. When I was a kid, I was a bit of a brat, if I do say so myself. And although I lived in the countryside where there was nothing to do, at least nature sure was abundant. And so, I was the kind of kid who had fun by throwing frogs into trees to kill them, pouring boiling water on ants, and so forth. There were living things everywhere and, I don't know, I guess killing them was fun. But now, I can't even look at bugs, let alone touch them. And the reason for that is Kodoku. You often see Kodoku in manga and stuff like that, 
So maybe you're already aware of what it is, but it's when you gather a bunch of insects, snakes, etc. and put them all in a fixed spot until they all kill each other and only one, the strongest, is left. You then use the strongest survivor to make a strong curse to kill someone you hate. And so, I tried doing that myself. Now, I only did this because I saw it on TV or something. It wasn't like I actually wanted to curse anyone. I was like, wow, the animals will fight each other and only the strongest will be left. That's so cool. I didn't take it very seriously at all, and I tried my hand at actually making Kodoku. I was on summer vacation, and so I had a lot of free time. I tossed whatever I could find into a plastic case. From what I can remember, there were grasshoppers, praying mantises, ants, spiders, drone beetles, stag beetles, crickets, frogs, lizards. And for whatever reason, I tossed in grass and empty cicada shells as well. I heard that you were supposed to collect poisonous creatures, but, well, I was just a kid after all. And so, after half a day's hard work collecting bugs, Naturally, the inside of the case was a mess. Things had piled up all over the place and it was like a massive traffic jam. I was so grossed out that I couldn't look directly at it, so I later buried the whole case in the backyard. Having done that and feeling good about myself, I forgot about the case for a while. It was almost the end of summer vacation when I finally remembered it again. I went into the backyard that day and dug up the case. Naturally, I was a little scared of what I might find. It would no doubt be full of dead bugs, right? But when I dug up the case, I didn't find quite what I expected. Other than some of the grass I'd put in there, the whole thing seemed to be full of dark, muddy water. It had rained while it was out there, so maybe I hadn't put the lid on tight enough. And then, when I opened it, I saw it. The sole survivor. I couldn't tell what it was, but it was moving around really fast. It was jumping around or something, and then it jumped onto my arm, and I felt a sting of pain. It must have bitten me. It then jumped away, and the spot on my arm where it bit me really hurt, like I'd been stabbed with a needle or something. I was so surprised that I dropped the case I was holding. The muddy water spilt out and I could see all sorts of gross carcasses and stuff on the ground. The spot on my arm where it bit me turned red and then quickly started to swell. That most definitely wasn't normal. It started to swell to the size of a golf ball right before my eyes. I had been stung by a bee before, but it was nothing like that. I ran into the house crying and screamed at my grandfather. A bug bit me! All hell broke loose after that. They drove me to the hospital, but then I had to go to an even bigger hospital after that. The doctor asked me what bit me, but when I said, Kodoku, he just looked at me strangely. I fell unconscious with a high fever after that, and for the next two or three days, they feared I might die. In the end, I was in the hospital for almost a month. After I got out, my parents and grandfather were furious with me and made me promise never to do anything like that ever again. But that was unnecessary because I was the one who was most scared after that. While I was in the hospital, I had numerous dreams in which I was killed by insects. It wasn't just a traumatic experience. It became a full-blown phobia for me. I was so afraid of bugs that, starting from junior high, I moved away from the countryside and into the city. Let me just say this now. You should never, ever do what I did. If you really do try to do it for real, then you'll undoubtedly die. A huge thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Christina and Estash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Bankai, Baffling Japanese Internet Mysteries Volume 3, 
out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at kowabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Kowabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on kowabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kowabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to kowabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to kowabana.net now.